Okay, our next session is titled Tethered Cord with Surgical Detethering, an Isolated Case or an Under-Recognized Comorbidity in Children with CTNNB1. Uh, please welcome Dr. Sandrine Cornaz burros Department of Pediatrics, Neuropediatrics at Bern University. Hello everyone, I, I hope you can hear me well and you can see my presentation. We can hear you, we can't see your presentation yet. I think it should start now. There you can go. You see it? There. And we Thank can't you see much. you. Maybe flip the camera. I think I can see myself if that's you. on the Yes. There you go. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to this conference and showing um, this uh, presentation. I'm sorry, I cannot be um, in Ljubljana. I would have really uh, wished to, but um, maybe next time. So I will talk about um, an important topic, I think. Um, it's about tethered cord. And I will present a case which we had in our clinics and um, of a child. And then I will talk a little bit about um, tethered cord and CTNNB1 neurodevelopmental disorder. So first, let's start with our four-year-old girl, who is a girl who is over there in um, Ljubljana today. Um, she presented at the age of two months with a failure to try, feeding difficulties. At four months of age, there was a global developmental delay, which was seen um, at the neuropediatric ward. And she, in the course of the, of the month, developed a cerebral palsy. It was described as ataxia with spasticity. She also developed eye anomalies um, with um, strabismus. She was then diagnosed through um, trio whole exome sequencing with a de novo variant of CTNNB1, the stop variant. With three years of age, that's when I um, met our patient for the first time, uh, she was actually showing a progressive spasticity in her legs. And um, she could not walk, she was not ambulatory, and she really had her feet going into the equine position. And the mother insisted that she had contact with other parents on Facebook, which had the same diagnosis, and that other children did have a tethered cord. And so she, she, she asked for a spinal MRI. At first, I was skeptical, and I went into the literature, and I couldn't find many uh, reports. Or actually, I didn't find anything. But as um, because of this, the progressive spasticity in the leg that was really uh, impressive in that girl, we decided to go for that spinal MRI. And that was February 2023. But before I talk about that MRI, or maybe I can I can show you quickly the findings that we found, we, we did actually find here uh, a tethered cord. She had a film terminal lipoma, and the cord was uh, attached too low on the, on the spine. And the spine, and you can see, I don't, uh, you can see that uh, on the spine, you have a, a light place, which is filled of a fluid, which is an enhancement of the central canal. All these findings should not be there. And these findings correlate with um, tethered cord. And what is tethered cord? We already heard this morning about tethered cord in a previous talk, but basically it's a group of neurological disorders that are linked to malformation of the spinal um, uh, of the spine. And there are several forms that which exist. Uh, you can have a tight film terminale, lipomeningiocele, or a split cord malformation. All form involve the pulling, pulling of the spinal cord at the base of the spinal canal. It's literally tethered and, and really it, it's attached to, to where it should be free and floating. And if it's uh, left untreated, it will lead further on through growing of the spine to damage. And so this is just a, a little, um, little um, picture of what is tethered cord on the left side. You have a normal spinal cord with a spinal canal and the tailbone. And on the right side, you can see that the spine, um, the, the, the spinal cord is stuck to the spinal canal, is too low, and you have, in that case, a lipoma. So what are the symptoms of tethered cord? Well, you have some cutaneous symptoms. Uh, which can appear some 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 change of the of the lower back, some tuft of hair surrounding um, the the tail of the of the um, 
at the lower back. You can have foot or spinal deformities. You can have a weakness in the leg with a loss of muscle strength or tone or an increase in the spasticity in the legs. You can have a change in the gait, um, awkward, awkward running. Um, you can have low back pain in the bigger children, scoliosis, which is a curvature of the, of the um, spine. And more specifically, urinary irregularities, either with an incontinence or retention. And actually, bladder dysfunction is a very common finding and often the only and first finding in these children, which can lead further on if the bladder, uh, the bladder abnormalities are left untreated, can lead to renal dysfunction and further symptoms. So in our girl, um, she was actually showing an increased spasticity, which was progressive, and she had a bladder dysfunction, which is called the trosa hyperactivity in our case. So this, according to our local guideline, is um, indication for surgery and dead tethering of the, of the spine. She luckily had simple postoperative follow-up, no major complication, and four weeks post-surgery, my colleagues from the neurosurgeon um, are um, writing about improvement of spasticity in the leg as well as the gait. In February 2024, she had another bladder function test and this, this time it was normal. She did have a normal bladder function, which was abnormal before. Her post-operative MRI scan showed mobility of the filum terminale and her gait was improved when speaking to the mother. She's actually now learning to go, on, still holding onto um, a little chariot, a little, uh, a little um, with wheels, but she is learning to walk. So my question or what I was very surprised because at first when I looked up this mutation and tether cord, I, I didn't find much in the literature, almost nothing. And so I was asking myself, as these children have a progressive spasticity, what is actually the prevalence of, um, of tethered cord in those children? And we know that in CTNNP1, the spasticity predominate in the lower limbs. Spinal MRI, according to literature, is normal in most cases. However, some cases have been described and there are several publications to that, but it, it's described as being anecdotal. Gene review comes in mentions uh, consider MRI spine of if evidence of spasticity in the lower lab. Well, this is kind of vague because most of the children with this mutation do have spasticity in the lower leg. But for me, it's a, a very important question because it has direct therapeutic consequences. So with Spella and um, we started uh, a questionnaire to the parents, maybe some of you received it, to ask whether your, your children had a tethered cord. And the questions were very simple. Does your child have spasticity in their leg? Has your child had a spinal MRI? Have your child been diagnosed with a spinal diploma, tethered cord or other spinal problem? And please specify. And has your high child had surgery, spinal surgery, and actually the, the, the numbers are quite impressive. Uh, we had about 84% of the children who had 76 parents who did answer, which is a lot. We had 84% which did have spasticity in the legs. Of those patients, about 40 had a spinal MRI, so about half of the children, and of those half, a third did have a tethered cord and a third had surgery, which is impressive. It's a high number, it's much higher than what I had expected. And here are the numbers again, uh, where you can see that 50% uh, of the children did not were not screened, so we don't know whether they have an occult tethered cord. And the other half, about 30%, did have a tethered cord, did have surgery. Another 30% another had other spinal anomaly, mostly bone anomalies. And a third had a normal MRI scan. So, so you can see that of the patients that were screened, only a third had a normal MRI. So in conclusion, we can say that tethered cord is probably much more common than expected in children with CTNNB1. As we as it was reported in 30% of the screened children, 
Whereas we have to say that we have probably a big um, bias in this questionnaire, as if you send a questionnaire out to parents, the parents that did have their children have a tested cord, have surgery, will be much more prone to answer to that questionnaire as the other parents who maybe did not have this issue and did not think and never heard about it. But still, it's much more children than, than we thought. And it is therapeutically relevant, um, especially regarding progressive spasticity and bladder function, because it, ca it can be relieved surgically. But as already mentioned, we need to analyze this in a scientific way with a systematic review, and it has to be reviewed also by, by, by doctors. And the, the, the last point is we have no data on the outcome of those children after surgery, if the, if the spasticity went better, if the child were getting better, we don't know, we have just our isolated case from which um, I can, I can uh, report. And so this raises the question whether uh, spinal MRI should be performed in all children with CT and MD1. Well, I think the answer, it should at least be discussed. And if the MRI is performed, it should be done in supine and prone position. Because if you do an MRI only on supine position, you might miss a, a, an ocular dysrophism or a tethered cord because you, you will miss the lack of movement if you put the, uh, the child in, in prone position. Sometimes some tethered cord have only are at, at the right angle, right level, um, and don't have a lipoma or very thin lipoma, which you don't see. And if you put the child then in prone position, then you see that the, the cord does not move. And this is a, a very key feature. And actually in Bern, we have this protocol already since about 10 years. And we have a number of cases for, for other tethered cord, not for CTN and B1, but of other cases where um, we did diagnose the tethered cord only in, uh, in um, supine position and the, the child, the, we would have missed it uh, in, in prone position, we would have missed it in supine position. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and, and thank the team with whom we are working, Professor Grund with head of the neurorehabilitation in the Inselspital Bern, and Katharina Lutz and um, Cordula Schera with our board, both a surgeon, one is pediatric surgeon, the other neurosurgeon, and both did the surgery on that child. And um, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me and organizing this um, uh, parent-based questionnaire. And I'm happy to take any questions from the audience if they are.